Okay, great. Okay, cool. I think we're recording. Um, so what we're going to do is go through our um, category vision for secrets management and talk a little bit about what the ideas are here, what we're going to be working on, and so on. Uh, do feel free to ask any questions uh, as we go. I'll go ahead and share my screen. Okay, so secrets management. Um, one of the things that we have in GitLab is environment variables. Uh, and if I pull up this little project of my own and go into um, CICD or settings CICD, um, there's this section uh, variables here where you can store different things. And I have, you know, it, what's very commonly stored here are secrets like. Um, things that are used for deploying. Um, they can be stored per environment, um, and you have a lot of flexibility here. Um, it's great that these are stored in um, GitLab, and they are, secured stored, uh, <laughs> they are stored securely in GitLab. Um, but there's a tool out there, uh, HashiCorp Vault, uh, which is an open source tool uh, with an enterprise edition, kind of the same thing as GitLab. Uh, and uh, it can store those secrets for you. And, a lot, and more and more companies are using Vault uh, and they have a Vault instance already, uh, and they want to store their secrets that GitLab CI CD uses uh, inside of their Vault instead of in GitLab, so they have one less place to worry about where the secrets are stored. Um, that's kind of the element that we came into secrets management with, um, but you can imagine there's more that we can do here. Uh, one is allowing um, GitLab to be an interface to Vault um, so that secrets that are associated with a project you can manage while you're still in GitLab and, and use GitLab to, um, to control all of those um, and interact with them. Another really interesting one, which is in uh, the video from Sid, is actually storing GitLab's own secrets inside of that vault um, that's available um, out there. Um, and in doing so, we make GitLab even more secure. Uh, even though GitLab is, um, is already secure, it has its own features, just getting it out of the system just adds that one more layer of security uh, and into something that's, that's really well trusted out there in the market. So uh, we have some different ideas here about what we want to do. And I apologize, but I'm just going to be quickly scanning through sections as I talk about it. Um, so I may pause for a minute speaking. Um, but um, well, I'm going to jump first into what's next and why. Um, so the Verify team, as it says here, is delivering that feature where uh, secrets for the CI/CD pipeline are going to be able to be stored in, in a, a vault, any vault, whether it's one that we provide or it's one that um, uh, the customer already has. Uh, we want to support both of those because there are a lot of customers who have a centralized vault um, that they're already having at the enterprise level. Uh, and so um, uh, one of the things that we're looking at doing eventually, which is um, having users install vault into their own Kubernetes cluster, or having uh, it included in the Omnibus package, uh, what that means is that we can guarantee a uh, Vault instance is available to any GitLab instance. So whether we're pointing to the customer's one that already existed, whether we're using the one that is deployed via Kubernetes by the customer, or the one that just is bundled with the Omnibus installation, which is kind of the default installation package for GitLab, um, there's going to be a Vault instance available. And that unlocks us to do those other later features that I was talking about, like having GitLab be an interface to Vault and also having um, GitLab store its own secrets in the external Vault. Okay, so uh, question. Yeah. So the idea, so then the idea is, is that uh, for the user journey, we're looking at, you know, A, you can bring your own, um, or B, we, we can provide you, uh, this is a default. That's right. Uh, okay. And then you said um, that they would bring it in through their Kubernetes cluster, their own, and, and then the Omnibus package is where we would uh, supply the default. Is that correct? Uh, yeah. Well, I, any of those would be able to be configured to be the instance of choice for your GitLab instance or your uh, okay. project. Um, okay. But um, yeah, like there's, there's different places in here. Um, in, inside of Kubernetes, we have where we can install, well, I don't have a Kubernetes cluster associated with this project, mm -hmm. but you can install Jaeger for tracing. Uh, you can install Prometheus. You can install these different tools. So we can make it very easy for a customer to install an instance of Vault into the Kubernetes cluster if they're using Kubernetes. Uh, and that's one what way that we can do that. 
or their or their other choice. Yeah, right. well, omnibus is another choice, right? Like, so if you're deploying into um, using the omnibus package, um, then you mm -hmm. we also eventually wanted to deliver it in that way. Okay. Um, and then again, a, a lot of larger companies that we sell to are they already have their own vault instance that's centralized and managed, and we want to support them not having to spin up a, sec a second instance that's associated only with GitLab, but just allow them to point to their own, um, you know, central centralized vault. Okay. All right. Um, and just curious, like at this point, like the, the current experience through GitLab, you showed me it's in the environment variables. Is this been intuitive and, and easy for our users to leverage for that purpose today? Um, yeah, I think the, the environments, um, or sorry, variables in this way are pretty easy to use. It's a, a pretty clear way of interacting with them and um, is similar to other things that you might find on the market. Um, mm -hmm. The vision for this, which is still early and still being, um, you know, defined a bit, is um, that we would have vault-backed keys here that you could choose, like this is a key that's actually in vault. Um, and maybe one thing that I'm missing is the way that this works on the back end is that um, GitLab will have a key that it can use um, to, when it talks to vault to request an actual temporary key that will work for the environment that it's um, going to deploy to. Um, so GitLab never has a permanent key that will last forever. Like the keys that I have here for my little test project uh, are the real permanent keys that are like the final version. If I wanted this to work with Vault, I would take those, put them in Vault, uh, and then I would set up a key inside of this project so that it can ask Vault for a temporary key that it can then use to deploy to production. And then if this was ever hacked or like I accidentally printed out the value, well, that key would have expired a long time ago and um, it's uh, more secure in that way. That's brilliant. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so tying it onto the, the variables here, it makes a ton of sense for the okay. CXD portion. Okay. <clears throat> and then, so the idea would be that the interface that we would do um, would auto populate this area. Potentially? Well, yeah, potentially. The UI is still open, um, but another way that you could imagine it is that there's um, just like a, a toggle here that says vault, um, and then if you click it, then this variable gets stored in vault um, instead of here. Um, Got it. That yep. would probably be a pretty slick way to do it. Um, there may be some technical issues with something like that, but um, yeah. Yeah, no, that would be super slick. Okay. And a question, have we done anything uh, of a similar pattern before um, at GitLab? No, we have some customers who've written this functionality inside of their pipelines directly. Um, so uh, they, they're essentially doing it by hand uh, using API calls written into their GitLab CI YAML. Um, and that's possible. Um, Although it's not as nice, of course, and it's not as, not as it's not, not as secure nice. either, because then you're 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 having the um, you know the key be available to the runner in a way that wouldn't necessarily be required here, depending on how we implement it. Okay. All right. And then when we introduce this type of new feature, you know, just something like this, where we're adding a new op, you know, a new opportunity that has like to your point, like a slider button saying in, in, install in Vault. Mm -hmm. um, how do we how do we work through that sort of advertisement and understanding that new functionality is there when like I'm sitting on this screen? Um, is there do you do you do tool tips for a certain time frame or or do you yes. do an explanation? So we have tool tips. Um, here's one. This this is one way we do it. Um, this take, this took us to the documentation for um, for variables, which makes sense. Um, and then there's a uh, a bit here. Sometimes we have some text in here. Um, I think probably we would want some kind of overlay there. The other way we would communicate this is we would do it through um, the blog post. Um, and so maybe we would say something here like, it's also possible to, to use um, this, these variables backed by Vault. If you're interested in installing that, we can do it directly through Kubernetes uh, and so on, and whatever the, um, yeah. But this is a feature that's actually really popular. And we've got a lot of customers who are really interested in 
adding this. So this is one that is going to be easy to find uh, people who people are, are going to interested adopt. in adopting it and can be early adopters of this feature and we can refine the UX with them. Okay. Question. Yes. So adding that piece, like thinking about that as the potential visual for that and the functionality, is there any other things that we would put in the future want to put in that variables area that might clutter the space or um, add more complexity to that area that you can think of? Well, I think that we could probably use a bit of thinking about this in general. Um, we've recently added this masked column and sometimes it doesn't make sense for it to be here based on the context. Um, so I guess to answer your question directly, I don't see off the top of my head an order of magnitude of complexity being added based on this new type. It could even potentially be a type of variable. Uh, could be uh, one called vault back. Mm -hmm. um, that might be a simplified way to do it. Um, yeah. but, but to your uh, point, the mass probably re review and say, oh, yeah, do it doesn't really make sense. Like for file, mass doesn't make any sense. Um, but um, but environment does, and uh, there's this environment selector here, which could potentially be improved. Um, so there are definitely improvements and simplifications that we can do to this interface. It's, it's sort of ended up as like an Excel sheet type thing, um, but um, it is serviceable for now. And I don't think that immediately adding uh, Vault is going to push it over the edge, in my personal opinion. Okay. And then when we see save, val uh, save variables and reveal values, the yeah. assumption would be, the working assumption would be that if we hit that reveal values, um, that would be the temporary information from Vault versus the permanent. And so there's a, a low risk there. Yeah, so, uh, well, it, I don't think you would want to reveal it, to be honest. Um, okay. Although uh, it may depend on the implementation of Vault. So uh, the, there will be a key for the project or for the group or something that's a secret key um, that won't even be here. That'll just be for, about the integration with Vault. And that will be the key that Vault trades. So what would be in the, um, there would be no value, but there would be a key. Uh, and that key would be the ID that GitLab needs to use mm -hmm. in conjunction with the, um, uh, in conjunction with the secret key to request the right value back that it can then use to do whatever it needs to do. Right, so then there's another sort of UX UI thing that needs to be evaluated as part yeah, of Yeah, so, um, All right. yeah, I, I'm not 100% sure. Maybe the key would still be there because you need a name for it to come in as, uh, and then the value would be the secret that's exchanged um, in combination with the other key. Um, That's what I was saying, yeah, but then you wouldn't want to reveal it to your point. Well, you wouldn't temporary. reveal it probably, and, um, unless you were having to do something like um, update it. Like if you, if you change it on the vault side for some reason, you would need to then update it here. Um, it would depend on how we build these associations. Um, okay. All right, I'm going to step back, and I, I dug a little there, but let's step back and just yeah. kind of go down to like the... Um, Talking about target audience and experience. What's yeah, we'll next? About that a bit. The target audience yeah. is uh, is going to be primarily so developers are going to be interacting with that interface that we just saw, um, mm -hmm. and that's uh, they're an important user there, of course. Uh, but mm -hmm. the primary user of this is going to be security teams who are rolling out some policies at their organization. That's about if uh, you have a secret key, it needs to be stored in Vault, and so they will be thinking about this in terms of kind of broad usage across the product. Um, so something interesting there, like maybe some companies will want all of their, um, like all variables automatically always stored in Vault, um, and it's just a requirement. Um, others may have a policy where only secure variables need to be stored there, um, which would be more complex for us to implement or enforce because we don't know really what's secure or not. Um, but um, but that, that will be the perspective that they're coming at it from. And do we have um, security uh, customers from security that would help us fulfill a little bit more of this user persona and give us some additional perspective? For sure. We've also got internal users uh, here at GitLab. Okay. 
Uh, so we can we can hit this from a number of, of angles. But yeah, we got great customers to talk to who already have who are already using Vault, and you can ask how they're using it. We've got the ones who've implemented a manual workflow inside of the GitLab CI YAML, so we can learn a lot from how they've done things. And some of those comments will be in the issues that uh, as you dig in and open those up. Right, and it's probably something also to, to note in the user experience as we start to execute on this is, what do they have set up today and how will it play when it's available in GitLab? Yeah. Um, so that it's a smooth transition for them. Yep. Yeah, okay. there, there's a synchronization of making sure that the vault knows GitLab and GitLab knows the vault. And so managing that configuration has to be done at the, you'd probably do it in somewhere in here, like um, maybe, yeah, I, well, I don't know where, but somewhere in the settings for the project or the group, there would be the vault integration set up. Uh, and only the managers of that project would have access to that. But then everyone would be able to take advantage of it, which would be great. Got it. Um, another item that we have here on the maturity plan, which uh, contributes to, to making this work nicely, is um, con contributing to Vault a um, auth method so that you can log into Vault using your GitLab ID, which will make some of the features that we're going to build later a little easier to use. But will overall just provide a nicer experience where there's um, you know, consistent um, authorization across the products. Now it's true, a lot of our enterprise customers are going to have like, you know, uh, corporate uh, uh, Active Directory or, or whatever that, that's unified. Opta, whatever they do, yeah. Yeah, uh, whatever. Um, yeah. But uh, this, will be, this will be a nice little helper, for, especially for smaller teams. Okay. Um, and then in terms of the competitive landscape, so Vault is an important solution that's out there on the marketplace, but there's actually also, um, solutions that are provided directly by other cloud providers. Um, KMS is provided by Google. And I think actually with KMS, you can have it use Vault, and that's the, um, the solution that it uses on the back end, or you can use the, the arbitrary Google one. Mm -hmm. And then um, on the Amazon side, there's, um, I think they offer both software keys, key management, and a hardware-based key management. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, those are uh, other potential backends that we could support. The nice thing about Vault is that it can be installed anywhere. Um, so it's kind of the multi-cloud solution that's safe to use, whether you're with Google or whatever. But some companies uh, will be all in for Amazon and want to use their, their solution or, or vice versa with Google. Um, so we will probably want to build things in a way that Vault could be replaced, um, and instead of backing, you know that that same screen that we were looking at with these passwords, like you could have these stored in KMS or I can't remember what uh, Amazon calls it. Like uh, I can't even remember off the top of my head, but right. Uh, so like we so we would one leverage this as a baseline uh, and how we engineer it, yeah. um, to, and port and make it portable for other services. Right. Um, whether we offer those services, you know, we say it's all three or we do, you know, one, we have that uh, capability. Yeah. And so it's something we want to keep in mind as we're building things out. I think that we want to start with Vault just because it is available everywhere. You can use it no matter where you are. Um, but we will hear from customers who are wanting to use one solution or the other. And so we'll need to be listening to that uh, and make sure that, um, that we're responding to that. Okay. Um, the other interesting element in the competitive landscape is that Vault offers an enterprise product as well, uh, and it does more things. Um, so just like there's a free version of GitLab out there that somebody could, in theory, bundle with their product, there's also an enterprise mm -hmm. version of GitLab out there. Um, the Vault enterprise version adds a few things that are, that are noted here that may be interesting to different customers. Um, the ones who are using this are probably going to be the kinds of customers we were talking about early where they come with their own Vault, and they just want to point GitLab at it, and it will have these features. Um, but some of them may require us to do something different to take advantage of. Um, some of them, I think, will probably come for free. Like if they're using the hardware security modules to back uh, their Vault instance, then I think just us storing our stuff in there probably uh, just takes advantage of that. Um, but namespaces? Um, we may need to modify this UI to allow people to choose the vault namespace that 
this item goes into. I'm not 100% sure, um, but that research needs to be done. Okay. We should so basically the, uh, somebody who uses the, the version of GitLab that doesn't have all these advanced uh, Vault Enterprise features enabled should still be able to get the same functionality out of GitLab and Vault that they would get if they weren't using right. the Enterprise version. But different ones of these features may be more important to some of our users. And uh, we'll want to be talking to them and ask, you know, if you're using uh, Vault Enterprise, you know, what, what, why did you buy Vault Enterprise? What were the features that made a difference? And then we need to think about how do we make sure that we're not, um, you know, missing those features when they use uh, the Vault Enterprise with GitLab? Right. Makes sense. Yeah. Uh, so I think we've covered everything in there. Okay. Uh, yeah, there's these three, the, the, these trio of issues um, that really get the ball rolling, and they're all uh, linked to each other. <laughs> Not in this one, actually. Okay. Um, okay, that's funny. Um, let's see. Yes. Ah, okay. I must have moved an issue and I haven't corrected it yet. Um, so vault instance for gitlab.com users is something that's out there as well. Um, they'll be able to use the Kubernetes version if they're using uh, gitlab.com. Um, mm -hmm. But installing an instance of vault for every user of gitlab.com would be very, very complicated and very potentially expensive. And we don't know if we want to go down that route. Maybe we can do like a mega instance. But this issue um, is something that we need to be thinking about and how we're going to make this feature available to everybody who uses GitLab.com in addition to self-managed or people using GitLab.com who happen to have a Kubernetes cluster or somewhere to install Vault. Okay. okay. So in these sections, a lot of the issues that are pointed to as the most important ones are around just getting these first features out. Um, it's a sign of a new category is a lot of the features will be like, or a lot of these sections will be like the top user issue is deliver the MVC. The top customer success issue is deliver the MVC and so on. <laughs> um, but we have right. had some customer conversations um, around uh, internal customer conversations. Uh, and these so far have been around uh, moving our own secrets into um, uh, into a vault. Um, so there's some interesting issues here that are about how we can do that uh, and how we can get those things moved over. Um, Got yeah, it. Uh, this would, rec uh, if GitLab is going to store its own secrets in a vault, we would need to be in a place where a vault of one kind or the other is guaranteed. Um, because if it's, not, if it's not there, then there's no place to store them. Absolutely. Um, yeah, yeah, and so I think that's everything here in this category epic. Yep, and then it says here maturity plan. The category is currently at the plan maturity level. Our next maturity target is minimal. Yeah, so what this is saying is that this is something that we want to do, and delivering these two, these two issues uh, means mm -hmm. that we will have delivered a basic uh, bit of functionality that we can call minimal and somebody could use. Okay. Um, I'm looking at the first one, allows you to install a hash core with the Kubernetes cluster. Mm -hmm. um, and this would, so this is, this is probably the first thing that we'd want, because I saw that there was a target Q2 uh, to make Volt available. Yeah. So this would probably be our first target based on what I'm seeing here. Well, um, uh, um, where did you see the Q2 target for that? I'm not, I don't doubt that. Um, it was in it was in the um, analyst report that we're that you guys are working on right now. Ah, uh, yeah. Um, so we do the the CI/CD portion of this, which will allow you to point it to uh, your own vault instance. Um, that mm -hmm. is scheduled within Q2. Um, these are both scheduled within Q3 because we're uh, and this is our fis GitLab fiscal year. Uh, ah, I see. Okay. Uh, so. The, both of these, I think, are scheduled for uh, two months from now. Okay. Uh, which is technically a Q3. So we'll probably have a Q3 OKR that's all about delivering vault. 
uh, or at least like up leveling it um, so that uh, more people can take advantage of it. Okay, so okay, so this okay, so this is the verified team what they're working on. Yeah. Check. Got it. Which is where um, all of this started, really, uh, and yeah. uh, there was that issue that we were hearing customers wanting to use CI/CD with GitLab. Um, yep. And Sid had his brainwave about, um, you know, storing GitLab's own secrets. And we realized that there's actually a broader strategy here and an entire category that we can start to develop. The other part of this that we haven't touched on too much um, is the use case of having um, just GitLab be the provider of Vault um, so that we're providing a secret management solution for a company. So imagine you're a small company and you're not using Vault today. Uh, you're only a customer of GitLab, and you want to start, you, you realize you've got all these secrets that you need to manage for your production environments or for anything in your business. Um, right. We don't, as GitLab today, offer a solution. We could say, hey, go install Vault, and they can go contact somebody at Vault or download it and read the instructions and install it. Um, but because we're we want to be the single application that can deliver all of this functionality and, and be everything you need to run a company and deliver software in a DevOps model, um, we want to be able to provide that and have it be part of our solution and, and have it just be automatic and easy. Um, so that's the right. So the user experience is smooth. It's, you know, the registration and, and setup of that is already integrated into the natural user journey and yeah. setting up their GitLab. Um, so you can imagine a section here, um, maybe under operations or somewhere else that says, yep. and you click on this and it takes you to just a page where you're managing secrets for your project that may be used by CI CD, may be used by your running application, maybe GitLab's own secrets are there, um, but it's just sort of like a place to manage secrets uh, and it's accessible from GitLab and it's a secret. That's why that's the way that we're providing a secrets management solution. In the right, You're, we're not actually having to like lift over to Vault, we can stay yeah. within the screen, yeah. Exactly, and remember that may be backed by KMS or maybe backed by the Amazon solution. So um, we're providing kind of a multi-cloud consistent solution for managing secrets in the end. That's the vision. Right, yep, that's awesome. Okay, um, okay, so then going back to uh, following here. So on the tails of the uh, Verify team enabling then we would um, work through the Kubernetes cluster yeah. and the auth me method. Yeah. Okay. The auth method is potentially debatable. Um, I sort of talked myself out of it a bit when I was talking about it earlier and I realized that most companies are gonna be using uh, LDAP or, or something like that, whatever the modern version right. of that is. Right. Okta, I guess, is, that, is the answer. Uh, and um, the, uh, so maybe, maybe we don't need that. That's something that we should actually evaluate and see if, well, maybe we should do some, some other bit. Um, well, maybe we just, maybe, we just uh, maybe the, the idea is that we understand uh, our user journeys in that space um, from those different angles and make sure uh, like that, you know, it all makes sense and that yeah. it works. Yeah. Um, uh, there is uh, the issue list here as well that might, would probably be interesting to look through. Um, there's only 15 issues there, so it's not too much. Um, there, this just has everything that we might work on and it's sort of sequenced out by release. It's showing everything by the milestone due date. So 12.2, 12.3, 12.4, 12.7. Um, mm -hmm. The dynamic secrets NVC is the one where we're potentially going to be delivering, um, you know, that, that management screen that I was talking about. Um, this one, I probably need to change the title on a bit to make it more clear. Um, these used to be sequenced in the other order. Um, so this, the title of this issue needs a bit of improvement because it's actually just ad talking about making the management a bit easier beyond this. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, bundling Vault with GitLab Omnibus. Um, yeah, here, here's the uh, the one that the CI or the CI team is working on. Yep. And then supporting the AWS Secrets Manager, supporting GCP Secret Stores. I was talking about those a bit. Um, mm -hmm. so there's some interesting things in here to, to take a look at and, and be familiar with, potentially change the order that we're delivering these things. Yep. Um, one thing that I think about, um, because this will require some uh, product design user experience, um, is um, 
just, you know, and it come, came up this morning when we were in uh, the release group is the um, ability uh, to, to test and demo this. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's something to think about of how we're going to enable the product and user experience team to be able to, to easily demo and work through the usability of this. Yeah, that's great. I love, I love the way you're thinking there. Um, yeah, uh, we'll definitely need to work with the, 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 you know, the marketing and sales teams to make sure that there's test data and that all of this can work and be set up pretty, pretty easy. I think it will be. Um, the, they're largely doing their demos out of Kubernetes these days anyway, so they can build an okay. environment that's already used our own automation to install Vault into the Kubernetes cluster, and, or they could even do that as part of the demo, which could potentially be pretty cool. Um, okay. Yeah, it's, it's really important to be thinking about those things early. The other thing to be thinking about now is how we're going to be measuring adoption of these features, how we're going to be managing customer feedback, and you know who your important customers are going to be, who your early adopters are going to be. It's good stuff to start thinking about now. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think that, um, that that has always been one of my main questions, is trying to identify um, because I, I would assume that we have a hypothesis against this, you know, when we start um, making this real. And it's how do we identify, I doesn't, like, I, I don't know if we have a really good way of identifying the types of users. Is that correct? Like whether they're a dev person, a security person, et cetera, et cetera, right? You mean when we're engaging with customers or uh, when they're using? No, actually when they're actually using the product. Ah. So is is there, you know, so it's like, oh, okay, well, we see an adoption, but but where's that adoption coming from? Yeah. Um, so that, I think that's what, something to think about is that might be yeah. a little bit of a roadblock, but um, so we have to think through that. Yeah, we do. We can make different measures, though, that can do a decent job. Like we can measure the number of um, instances that are, or groups or projects, depending on how we do the vault integration, that, um, mm -hmm are integrated with a vault. And we can measure, is it one that we installed or is it the customer's one? And that's some interesting bits of info. We can also say, okay, uh, now that the integration has been made, how many variables have been created? You know, all of this is anonymous, so we can you know, really figure out who's using what instead of, uh, without talking to actual customers and just like sitting down with them and watching them <laughs> use it. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but we can get pretty decent context in terms of, um, how many people are engaging in different kinds of behaviors that might be associated with different personas. Right, and then also um, as far as capabilities to understand uh, when things go south, right? So if there's a use case that we didn't think about um, and that there's, um, I mean, obviously somebody runs into it, they'll probably open up an issue, mm -hmm. but not everybody sits down and writes an issue sometimes. So I'm just curious if there's a, if there's a way that we can capture um, when they're trying to leverage it or use it, um, where they're getting stuck? Um, I don't think we have a way to do that programmatically now. Um, yeah. We might be able to measure certain kinds of errors, and if we're smart about the way we generate errors in the platform, then maybe we can potentially do something like that. Um, but I think a lot of that feedback, people actually with GitLab, they create a lot of issues and they're very, very engaged, and if there's something wrong, they will let you know, which is that sounds funny, but it's, it's fantastic. Um, the um, the other thing is just going to be sitting down with some of these large enterprise customers and just like working through it with them. Uh, we have some really great ones to work with, so I don't I don't think that that's going to be an issue. And uh, if we can get okay. it working in these really large installations, like you know gigantic companies with tens of thousands of users, um, then uh, we can be pretty confident that it's going to work for um, you know somebody who's got a, a few projects and sets up a vault and we install it for them. It's it, I I think we can be pretty confident there. The actual technology of, of doing this exchange is, um, is relatively straightforward. It's not, um, I think it's less complex than Kubernetes. Uh, if uh, someone may, may get me for making a statement like that, but the, um, ah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I do think that in this level of integration, especially as we're starting and we're building it up, it's not going to be over complex to start. Um, it should, for the most part, just work as long as, GitLab can reach Vault, and Vault has the identity of GitLab. Um, the handshake. It should work. Yeah, the handshake should work, and the exchange should should happen, and um, it should be relatively easy. Famous last word, but yeah. Um, okay. 
All right. Um, that was good. Um, any more that you want to call out? Because I feel like we covered quite a bit. Yeah, no, I don't think I have. I think that's a, a great place to start. I think browsing through the, um, you know, the issues and, uh, and thinking about it more deeply, um, you'll come up with more questions. Um, I thought about it a decent amount, but I, obviously you're going to have more time to, to dig in and, and find things that don't make sense. Uh, if you find something that don't make, doesn't make sense, it probably just actually doesn't make sense, so we should challenge it. Um, yep. uh, but yeah, um, I think that's a good okay. start. Okay. You know, just one last thing. So it's kind of going back to that user journey, ex that user yeah. experience, that user journey. When we work with our UX or product design folks, do they actually map a user journey or anything like that? Or like, like, the, like hey, here's, here's how you enter, like, I know that they do like wireframes and things like that, yeah. but like, do they, do they walk through the user journey at all? Uh, some do, some don't. It's a skill that we're trying to do more and more of in the organization. Um, so, okay. and building out a new, completely new category is a great place to start doing that. Um, okay. So yeah, I, I would recommend doing that. Um, cool. The folks know how to do it. We typically don't have time for it, uh, but uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm so, ambitious. Yeah, great, <laughs> awesome. <laughs> I'm ambitious. <laughs> I know, right? Okay. okay. I'm gonna stop Good. recording then. Um, thanks for the chat. Yeah, thank you.